Hello, everyone. Welcome. Listening now and in the future. This is the pre and perinatal um, talks by experts in, in the school of pre and perinatal healing. And tonight we have Susan Highsmith. Susan Highsmith is a counselor and educator residing in Tucson, Arizona. She holds a PhD in prenatal and perinatal psychology and is certifi certified in EMDR, Psych K, and EFT. She instructs and mentors master's and doctoral students, lectures at universities, community colleges, and speaks at international congresses ad addressing consciousness in the womb and the long lasting effects of our earliest experiences. Susan has published an easy to read primer introducing prenatal and perinatal psychology to young audiences, the renaissance of birth, changing the language of childbirth, and the first fairy tale books one, two, and three, the stories of conception, the awakening heart, and developing senses told in a way that every child can enjoy and every parent can delight in reading to their youngsters. More importantly, the stories are designed to be read to babies in the womb to enhance early bonding and to acknowledge the consciousness of the precious child in utero. In addition to being a nationally board certified counselor, Susan holds a doctorate in divinity from the American Institute of Holistic Theology and seeks to balance psychological theory and practice with spiritual and holistic w wisdom. She also gives great talks, so we're in for a treat tonight. Tonight she's talking about the consciously, consciously changing the language of childbirth, our words make a difference. So please, Susan, go ahead. Well, thank you so much, Kate. I can't tell you how pleased I am to be here. I'm so grateful for this opportunity. And I'm so grateful to each of you who are tuning in um, to give me this chance to share my passion because this is really what I feel like my life is about. It's a rather late in life awakening um, since I'm now um, well over three score and 10. But um, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be able to share this information and I'll tell you a little bit more about myself and of course my topic. So Kate, is it time to share the screen? Okay, where's my desktop, where am I? I'm not sure that's it, share my screen. So come, go down to the green button that says share screen in yeah, green. Click it and then select your presentation. I need to have something else going on here and I lost it. Okay. Let me do this. So when we practiced, I think I lost my screen and I need to, <laughs> I now have it so big I can't see anything else. Nothing we else can't. is coming up. You can't see what? I've got my whole screen up, but I'm not able to share it. And I'm not sure how to do that. You click, click, go down, down to the bottom of Zoom. You'll see a little green square that says share screen. No, there isn't one. I'm so, out of it. I'm going to have to do something to end my slide presentation so I can start it over again. OK, so you just push escape. I did. OK, so I am escaping there. Let me see if I can do this again. Share screen. Mm -hmm. There it is. Share. OK, I'm going to push play and we'll see if that works. OK, can you all see it? Yes. OK, great. Great. I'm not a wonderful techie. <laughs> OK. Oh, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. I need you to hold that vision for me. Okay, so our topic today is consciously changing the language of childbirth, that our words make a difference. And um, because I love uh, puns and alliteration, I call this some science and spirit of semantics. I've noted that I have a couple of um, credentials down here on the bottom, that I'm very interested in science and I'm interested in evidence, but I'm also interested in spirituality. So I've combined those things in this presentation and I trust that works. So let's start with this. This is a warning sign and it says that changes are ahead. But what we know is that everything is changing. Right now we are in the midst of enormous change. So we'll start with a little science. And this is um, based on chaos theory. You may have heard of it. Um, chaos theory is sort of quantum physical in its approach. And it's defined as a branch of mathematics that deals with 
complex systems whose behavior is highly sensitive to slight changes in conditions so that small alterations can give rise to strikingly great consequences. Well, that's kind of a mouthful, and I'm not sure that everybody would grasp that immediately. It was a little difficult for me. You might recognize it more as the butterfly effect. And that is the story or the um, thought that a butterfly in Brazil can waft its wings and clear on the other side of the world, a tornado could occur or a tornado could be averted meaning that small changes in this complex world of ours can make a big difference. And in just a moment, I'm going to relate that to this subject that is my specialty, which is prenatal and perinatal psychology, or for you, anyone who cares about mommies and babies, who is caring for them or who has them as students or clients or patients. So we'll find that out in just a moment. So in pre and perinatal psychology, we would like to see changes in the realm of childbirth. Some things will not change. Babies will still be born, mothers will still give birth. But where babies are born and under what circumstances can change. So many of us are attempting to make a difference in the realm of childbirth because we feel that change is essential for the mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual health of our children. One of the reasons that I got into this field initially was because I didn't want my granddaughters to go through what I went through. And what I know from my counseling practice is that people, virtually everyone, has prenatal and perinatal issues and they come up throughout life. And I didn't want everybody to end up on somebody's couch for counseling 30 years later if we could prevent it. So here's how we relate this subject to chaos theory. The small changes you make in the words that you speak can make an enormous difference. And this whole presentation is about how that comes about. So I'm gonna ask you a rhetorical question. That is one for you just to think about. You don't have to answer this. What inspired you to study and work in the realm of childbirth to work with mommies and babies? To tell your story or to hear mine, we need a common language. We need words. So I'll tell you a little bit about how I got into this. Probably in the 80s and 90s, I was already studying psychology, studying with a very gifted teacher and she also had a doctorate of divinity. So she became a, a role model for me. I thought, oh, I wanna be able to do both of those things as well. And in 1995, I attended a lecture by her where there were about a hundred people in the room. And she said, um, most of you are having difficulties because you were born in hospitals. And I thought, what on earth is she talking about? I was born in a hospital and there's nothing wrong with me. Ho, 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 little did I know until I did more study that many of the issues that I was facing in my life actually came out of that early, early time. And so I was driven to find out what she might uh, really mean by that because she didn't uh, tell us any more during that particular lecture. And in 2001, I let go of a VA contract that I had, uh, Veterans Administration, I was counseling for them to help people who were separating from military service. I let that go and during that year, I discovered Santa Barbara Graduate Institute, who was, that organization was offering um, advanced degrees, that is masters and PhDs in pre and perinatal psychology. And I thought, aha, this is a place that I can go to help answer this question that I have. And that's exactly what I did. So I enrolled in 2001 and graduated in 2006, um, actually at the age of 62. So it's never too late uh, if, if that's your choice is to go on and study. So let's start with a word. The word is conscious or consciousness. There's a guy named Stuart Hameroff. He's an anesthesiologist and he is a leading researcher in the realm of consciousness at the University of Arizona in the town where I live. And he calls consciousness a subjective phenomenal experience, another um, awkward phrase. But he also says in his YouTubes, it's really, it all boils down to being awake, being aware. So when we look at this picture of the baby, we would see, yes, it's awake, it looks conscious, aware, feeling, sensing, taking in information, exchanging ideas with us. Um, they're not verbal yet, these babies are not, but, but we can um, exchange information with them. So conscious and aware. The evidence supports the prenatal and perinatal perspective that babies are conscious and aware even while growing in the womb. So if we see here this young woman who's probably about five months pregnant, here, really ready to give birth and then holding her baby in her arms, 
we believe that from the very get-go, from conception throughout these early days of the pregnancy, all the way throughout the entire gestational period and in arms, these babies are conscious. So you were subject to environmental influences while you were in the womb as well. And I've chosen some pictures here that are uh, favorable, kind of ideal. So we see a mommy who's cradling her belly, I've got two of them who are just lovely and obviously happy to be pregnant. And then we see mommies who are supported by their partners. I would like you during the course of this uh, presentation to think about your experience. If you're already a mother and you have children, already a daddy and you have kids, um, it's uh, our inclination with that is to go to, oh my goodness, I'm learning something new. I should have done things differently. Just if you can today, stay focused on your own experience and see how this, this information might relate to your life. And then recognize as we go through this, you'll believe it more and more, that what was going on in your mother's womb, what was going on in her mind, uh, among her emotions, uh, whether daddy was there or not, whether you were wanted or not, all of these various concepts shaped the person that you are today. So are you aware, are you conscious of your any underlying beliefs that come from your own birth experience? So that's the question to carry with you throughout this presentation. So I've got some pictures here of some babies and what I would say is each one of them is a mind under construction. All of, all of these babies are forming the perceptions, the attitudes, the awareness, the beliefs that they will carry for a lifetime. Babies in the womb are like little sponges, absorbing everything in their environment, mostly from mom because mom is the primary environment. That means that thoughts, feelings, words, and actions all count eating healthy food, avoiding drugs and alcohol, keeping worry and stress down are all important. And so is being aware that everything said, felt, or thought is also sensed by the baby. When we're drawn out of the present moment, it is the little one within us attempting to get our attention. Now this is a beautiful way of sensing this, of, of expressing that we get triggered now and then. And, um, it is uh, Ray Castellino who was on this program a month ago, and I have heard speak several times uh, over this past several months, who uh, sort of coined this phrasing. This is an opportunity to change old patterns and to practice being present. It's difficult to do initially because when we're triggered, it is often um, what we feel is somebody else's fault. There's someone else to blame. It's not really us. Nonetheless, it all has to do with how we were initially um, conceived, gestated, and born. And it's an opportunity for us to recognize some of our old patterns and how we do get triggered and what we might be able to do differently. So I'd like to tell you a story. This is from Sibonfu Somme. Um, she's a member of the Dagara tribe in Africa. I learned recently that she has passed, which is a tremendous loss for us here. But um, she's just a lovely, lovely woman. And she wrote in this book that I've put down at the bottom, The Spirit of Inf Intimacy in 1997. She said that when a woman is pregnant, a hearing ritual is performed. Hearing, isn't that extraordinary? A listening, if you will. And in this ritual, the elders ask the unborn child, who are you? Why are you coming here? Why do you even bother? This world is so messed up. And what can we do to ease your journey? And then addressing the baby in the womb, talking to the mother's belly, the baby speaks through the mother's voice and says, this is who I am. I'm coming to help uphold the knowledge of the ancestors. Or as in um, Dr. Ikigawa in Japan is finding in 20 years of doing research and talking to kids who have um, pre and perinatal memories, in fact, even before conception memories, they're saying things like, I'm here to help my mother or I'm here to help planet Earth. The elders then prepare an appropriate ritual space in which to receive the child and make sure that everything is ready here before the child is born. After the birth, the elders make sure that they surround the child with the things that will help her remember and accomplish the purpose that she has described. And then there's another ritual. In adolescence, she goes through an initiation 
And this time she has an opportunity to go back and remember what she told them, remember what she said, and Pat perhaps even have conscious memory of what she thinks her purpose is for being on this planet. I think it's very regrettable in the United States that we have um, so few rituals. There are some in some customs. Um, there are um, uh, uh, various ways that we celebrate kids coming into puberty, but wouldn't it be wonderful if we had uh, a ritual besides a quinceanera, which is a Hispanic tradition, or a, um, a bar mitzvah for a, a young boy, that we, that we expand to our whole society this celebration of you're coming in, you are here, let us help you remember your purpose, and when women in particular go through puberty, there is another ritual. I would love to see that happening. And you may think of ways that you might be able to precipitate that in the communities where you live. Well, let me give you some evidence for this um, consciousness that we're talking about and babies hearing in the womb. So here are some headlines. The one on the bottom of the screen says, it's true, babies learn language while in utero. And here are a bunch of others. While in the womb, babies begin learning language from their mothers. They listen and learn while in the womb. I particularly like this one. Babies learn to recognize words in the womb. Be careful what you say around pregnant women because this is up to all of us. As a fetus grows inside her mother's belly, she can hear sounds from the outside world and can understand them well enough to retain memories of them after birth, according to new research. This is from Science Magazine, um, a wonderful resource that distills a lot of information from a lot of good sources. They're saying that language lessons start in the womb. David Chamberlain, one of our founders in the APA organization, um, Association for Prenatal and Perinatal Psychology and Health, would definitely have said that it's mother's tongue. The baby is listening to what mother is saying and gets familiar with her voice. Babies start learning language in the womb. This woman, this Dr. Gross, talks about how that happens. In this study, it's fascinating, this is 2018 research, talks about uh, listening and talking to people who speak Mandarin Chinese and comparing them with people who speak English. And they have a totally different perception of time. So the title of this article is Language Shapes the Way People Think and Behave. Here is a, a sweet little piece from the Cleveland Public Library, Born to Read, Reading to Your Baby in the Womb. Well, how has all of this affected me? I began learning all of this, as I told you, in the early 2000s. And so in 2000, about 13, uh, 12 and 13, I published a book called The First Fairy Tale. And the reason I did this is because I was teaching uh, classes as um, an invited instructor, a guest, in um, psychology classes, Psych 101 classes at a uh, community college. And these people, the students there, were 18 to 58 years old. Most of them were sexually active. Most of them, many of them were already married, having children, and they didn't know a thing about what we're talking about today. They really were clueless. And I thought, I need to start earlier. I need to start younger. So I went to a high school and the administrator said, no, you can't do this. The teachers are overburdened already. You would have to create extracurricular activities and provide buses for students to get home after and get permission from uh, the student's parents, because if you're talking about birth, you're talking about conception and sex. And so I got all this pushback and was not able to do that. And as I went younger in the school system, I couldn't find a place to enter. So I thought, what can I do? And I thought I can write books that, ba that mothers and daddies can read to babies while they're pregnant. So the first one is The Adventure Begins. The second one is about the heart forming called The Awakening Heart. The third one is called Making Sense, which is about sensors, senses developing. The fourth one, which has just gone to the illustrator, is about birth. It's called Welcome to the Light. And you'll see um, during this why I chose that title. So basically what I'm doing is saying, to start at the very beginning, have mommies reading to their babies not necessarily these books, but The Cat in the Hat is where the, start is, the study started. It could be any books that you're reading to the child to enhance bonding and to let that baby know it's being recognized and heard already in the womb. So Bruce Lipton has said, the music is laid down in the womb, the lyrics are added later. Imprints, impressions like music, are being laid down in utero. We as adults 
are behaving out of programs that were recorded in our brain minds during our development in the womb and during our childhoods. So here we have a pregnant mommy. She's reading to her little boy. So the sibling is already reading and bonding and, and um, exclaiming and the voice is being recognized and listened to by the baby in the womb. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had all been read to like this? But the, certainly the consciousness was not there um, when my mother was pregnant with me. But there is so much now uh, known. And now I have um, grandchildren and great grandchildren who are able to experience this kind of um, activity. So this comes from the UK. Um, they have wonderful, wonderful research and programs there. It says, mind your language. Babies listen to and remember words they hear in the womb. Now, this is a graphic that represents the neural connections that are going on. These are growing um, even in the last few months of a pregnancy within the baby's brains. There are a few myelinated circuits and there are a few connections already being made, but this is what happens during our early life. We begin to form beliefs. We begin to have perceptions about things. We are already developing biases and prejudices, and we have viewpoints, attitudes, about the various things that are going on in the world. And that comes from the programming that we get from our families. So your brain mind is programmed with everything you've ever seen, heard, touched, smelled, and tasted since you were conceived. Our brains are voracious. Recognize they're in a cranium. They are little gray um, tissue up there that has eyes out on stalks and ears out on the sides of our head. The skin that, be, that covers your body, our largest organ, is the same tissue that became your brain when you were an embryo. So all of these senses come online to feed that brain. Your thoughts and feelings are based upon what you experienced or what you had modeled for you as you developed. We call those beliefs and we think they're normal. So I'm gonna tell you a little story. Pretend that this woman in the middle in the white apron is me, Susan, and standing beside her is her 10-year-old daughter, Christy, and behind her is her mother, Betty. And we are preparing a Thanksgiving dinner. I'm making pies, rolling out pie dough. My daughter comes up, reaches into the dough bowl and, and takes a, a bit of the dough and puts it in her mouth. And I say to her, Christy, don't eat that dough. It'll give you worms. And my mother turned to me and laughed and said, Susan, where did you hear that? And I said, well, when I was 10, year old, 10 years old, and we were baking pies. You told me to stay out of the pie dough because it would give me worms. And now years later, like 20 years later, I'm telling my daughter the same thing because it never even occurred to me to question this particular belief. Well, beliefs can be old wives' tales. They can be biases or prejudices or simply explanations. Beliefs are how we make sense of the world, how we normalize our experiences, and how we think the world is. Our beliefs come, become our truth and our reality. And Bruce Lipton again says, um, from the biology of belief and the wonderful things that he does um, all over the world, is the secret of life is belief. Rather than genes, it is our beliefs that control our lives. Well, where do we, where do we generate these beliefs or store them or are we conscious of them? Are we unconscious of them? So what we know is that we have a brain, a neocortex that has two hemispheres. And the left side is the one that's more respected in our particular culture. Um, it's analytical, linear, logical, linguistic. It deals with words. The right side is thought to be more feminine, not as masculine as the left side. It's more creative. It has um, in, intuition, um, it's intuitive, emotional, creative, artistic, and it deals more with feelings. As a matter of fact, there are more connections on the right side down into the limbic centers of the brain so that we can feel more and we have these two divisions. And we could say that we're conscious of ourselves and the world and that our consciousness is our perception of ourselves and the world essentially being held in this brain that is, um, has two different facets a more um, analytical and logical part and a more feeling part. So what I would say is that words reflect our beliefs, our attitudes, and our perceptions. And so I'm going to give you a fairly easy example here. 
this an idea comes into your mind into your brain and it goes into your subconscious and it picks up an image associated with that idea and then it kicks out your belief or attitude i'm going to give you a fairly simple example here and i'll use the the word snow the word snow comes in and the image that someone might have would be oh wow i can hardly wait for winter I love skating. I can't wait to go on a family vacation. We're going to snowboard and we're going to ski. How fabulous. And so the attitude and belief is very positive. Another person might hear the word snow and say, oh no, I hurt myself shoveling snow. I got frostbite. Um, I, I don't like snow at all. Um, in fact, I would rather live in Tucson, Arizona where it's over a hundred degrees every day rather than, rather than be out in the snow. And so the attitude or belief becomes very negative. Well, how does this apply to the birthing arena? And so what I'm showing you here are two pictures of women right off the internet who are lying on their backs, which is not a real good thing to do, um, called the lithotomy position. And they think about birth and it goes back into their subconscious mind. And because of all the things that media has shown us and everybody is so afraid because of hospital procedures and so on, they associate birth with pain and it kicks out an attitude of fear. In fact, fear is so prevalent that there's a word that has been coined tocophobia. It's a pathological fear of pregnancy and it can lead to the avoidance of childbirth altogether. Even though a person has never experienced pregnancy, they're so afraid they don't ever want to experience, um, experience a pregnancy. So I've given you two pieces of literature here, two, two pieces of research. Um, one says, understanding women's attitudes and level of fear may help midwives and doctors to tailor their interactions with women. I think that's absolutely true. The data shows doctors that a woman's psychological state should be an important aspect of prenatal care. Right on. We need to move from pain to an idea of ease, from uh, this fear to more positive anticipation, and essentially mask this fear response with there's this beautiful woman doing some meditation. Uh, this might be hypnobirthing, uh, hypnobabies, other uh, mindfulness, calm birth, different kinds of things that we can do to help a woman prepare to give birth um, in a very calm, relaxed position with confidence and self-assurance. So we can move beyond what this um, prevalence of fear is in our society right now. So the connotations, the feelings, the perceptions that are associated with words count. A connotation is that idea or feeling that a word invokes in addition to its literal or primary meaning. Words help us communicate with others. We can tell them how we feel or what we're sensing in our bodies because maybe they're not intuitive enough to be able to perceive it, perceive it from our body language, maybe not empathetic enough. You may be, but words can really help us. I could not be giving this, this uh, talk now without words. Connotations of words evoke thoughts, feelings, images, and attitudes. Zig Ziglar, who was a big motivational speaker in past decades, said, words influence your perception of the world. The right wor words can do wonders for your attitude. The wrong words can also have a great impact on your attitude. So words are sound vibrations. And if we were able to see them, they might look like these rings, these vibrations that travel through space and reach another's ear. There's a man named Narang, and I'm quoting him a couple of times. I'll get to the actual reference in a minute. The word is an expanse of infinite vibrational energy. There are some traditions that say vibration is everything, that all is in vibration. So I want to point out this that Narang also said, the process of seeing is conversion of light frequency into cognitive energy in the consciousness. So I've chosen a picture of eyes, we're talking about seeing, we're talking about hearing, and I've chosen this little representation from Eastern tradition, which is the see no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil. And basically not seeing, speaking or hearing is difficult, it's hard because what we see, speak, and hear is based on our perceptions, our beliefs about what every sight, sound, and word means to us. Our individual consciousness is being aware of what we think sights, sounds, and spoken words mean. So that's why we're questioning all of these words that we are using, and that's what the rest of this presentation is about. 
So the Dalai Lama has said, to conquer oneself is a greater victory than to conquer thousands in battle. So we're contrasting here Eastern and Western philosophies. And Narang has said on a, a, a very interesting website that I found because I think that we're tied to everything. Everything is interactive. It's uh, interdependent. From a, a source called Economic Times, he said, sanctified vibrations of words can be resonations called the Shabdun in Indian spiritual thought. In Western thought, that is within the Bible, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So whether you are studying the Vedas, a Hindu tradition, whether you're studying the Christian Bible, the um, uh, Jewish Talmud, the Quran uh, in Islam, uh, the Buddhist scriptures, essentially they all suggest in their own words that, that words and ideas are creative and that thoughts precede those words. That the word that came out of the, the mouth of God, if you will, was an idea about the creation that we are now occupying. In Proverbs, in the Christian um, Bible, but the Old Testament, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. You could also say, as a woman thinketh in her heart, so she is. So here's the question. If thoughts and words create, what are we creating? <clears throat> so I'd like to point out another uh, person that you probably have heard of, a wonderful uh, pacifist, a peace activist. Um, and this is Mahatma Gandhi. And what he said is our greatest ability as humans is not to change the world, but to change ourselves. And he said this, which I thought is profound. Your beliefs become your thoughts. Your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your values. Your values become your destiny. And then he said, be the change you want to see in the world. So how do we be that change? It starts with us. Change starts with you. And your voice matters. So lots of different talks are given to about how a woman finds her voice, how she is no longer afraid to speak. And in speaking our voice, we are using words. So let's look a little bit at both psychological, what we might think of scientific and spiritual aspects of our minds. Dan Siegel, uh, who is a U of A, uh, uh, pardon me, uh, University of California in Los Angeles, he's associated with that organization and has been um, in the past, is a child psychiatrist who is quite brilliant. I like his first book, which is called The Developing Mind. Um, he's written a lot since, and they're all exquisite. He says that the mind is a system within a system. You remember when we started, we talked about complex systems. We talked about chaos theory. The mind is a system. It's comprised of energy flow. We talked about Narang's quote about everything being vibration, the words being vibration. It's comprised of energy flow. Mind and brain are not the same, but they can influence each other. So you might think about brain as hardware and the, your mind and the programming that you have is more software. Hammer off, the, again, this is that anesthesiologist out of the UA, U of A, calls um, the brain a neuronal synaptic computer. You can think of the, the brain as a computer. Uh, it's not a bad metaphor. As we move into more spiritual thought, we find that the word psychology itself derives from the Greek, which is the study of, the ology part is the study of, and the, the psych part is the psyche or the soul, breath, spirit, and soul. Most people don't go to psychiatrists or psychologists to talk about their spirit. They're really much more looking at what our traditional now definition is, which is the um, mental, emotional, and, and uh, physical aspects, behavioral aspects of what we um, think, um, what we feel, and what we do. But it could be that the mind and spirit interact with one another, that spirit inspires us. We respire every day respiration, we breathe in. And if you've studied some of the spiritual traditions, particularly from the East, yoga and so on, you know that there's prana or chi that flows in with the breath. Well, the difference between science and spirit is science would say, I'll believe it when I see it. And spirit says, I'll see it when I believe it. And then I found a new quote that I added this morning. This is from Nikola Tesla. And he said, my brain is only a receiver. In the universe, there is a core from which we obtain knowledge, strength, and inspiration. So there are different ways to perceive how we are taking in information 
and what we are able to generate, what we are um, perhaps guided or led or inspired to be able to produce. Now, in this particular graphic that I've chosen, there's a young woman and you see her head is full of all kinds of stuff and she is projecting that out from herself and she's taking in other energy from the world as well. As well. So there's likely a universal cosmic consciousness. In fact, there was a book written at the beginning of the 1900s by a guy named Burke, B-U-R-K-E, called Cosmic Consciousness. Jung coined this phrase, collective unconscious, which we all tap into. And Lynn McTaggart has created one called The Field of Energy. Her book, her first book is called The Field, which has become very popular. This field of energy, vibration, and consciousness influences us all. We are all part of this consciousness, and it's all part of us. So to get a little bit more concrete handle on what that means, um, Lynn McTaggart has said our field influences the world and vice versa. HeartMath, the HeartMath Institute out in California has for decades now been measuring heart field energy. And basically they describe it as a torus, a donut shaped radiance that extends from our hearts beyond our physical bodies and overlaps with the heart fields of others. And these two individuals, if you uh, were to see them opening their arms from fingertip to tin fingertip, it would be about six feet. So six feet all around us is this, um, this field of energy that others can sense and we can sense from others as well. So let us say we go into a party and we look across the room and we see somebody and we think, ooh, I don't like their energy at all. I think I'm going to avoid that person. Or another one where, oh, I'm so attracted to that individual. I wonder what that would be like to talk to them. And you go up and you, you strike up a conversation. It is heart field energies that we are feeling. Interestingly, now neurology has found that there are neurons in the heart and they have more information that they send to the brain than they receive from the brain. And the gut has neurons as well, lots of internal communication. So what I'm saying is that the mind, spirit, and heart energies may be interacting inside and outside of us. Now, here's a graphic that shows a man, um, just the uh, sort of uh, uh, inside view, showing that what's going on in there is going out to others. And so this is my contention from all the years that I have been studying both science and spirit through academia and through my spiritual studies, I contend that our thoughts, our consciousness, as well as our words radiate out to others, extending to them just like our heart energies and our vocal sound waves. The consciousness of human beings has incredible powers, according to Lynn McTaggart, to heal ourselves, to heal the word, world, in a sense, to make it as we wish it to be. In fact, we are creating that world right now with the very thoughts that we have, which is why it's important for us to be conscious of what we are thinking and what we are saying. So here we have a lot of images of books. And I just went to Amazon and I looked at change. Remember, one of the first slides we had was about change and chaos theory. Change is happening. Change your brain, change your life, change your questions, change your mind, change your heart, change your habits, change your thoughts. All of these are about change. I like this one in particular, words can change your brain. These authors are particularly well-schooled, uh, doctors, PhDs, who have come up with some wonderful ideas. I'll give you a quote in just a second. Essentially, this woman says, your body believes every word you say. You say, if you are a somatic psychologist, you probably know this. At a cellular level, we are carrying the frequencies, the impressions of what has been said to us in the past and what we have learned, what, um, what our traumatic experiences have been, what our joyful experiences have been. The quote from Words Can Change Your Brain is, a single word has the power to influence the expression of genes that regulate physical and emotional stress. Our words are affecting literally our genes, our DNA. Really, this is a big, big deal. So in 2014, I published The Renaissance of Birth. Now I changed the subtitle in a few years ago to changing the language of childbirth because this has become truly my passion. There is a woman who does this sort of thing. In her book, Talking to Babies, Healing with Words on a Maternity Ward, this is Miriam Seger. She is a psychiatrist in Paris. She's called into um, NICUs and uh, maternity wards where babies are being difficult to soothe. And what she does is she tells them their story. She tells them about their birth. My guess is the conversation would not be, well, you're okay now. 
or get over it, or you can be quiet now because everything is all right. It's not that kind of language. The language is more, oh, that must have been really hard for you. Here's what actually happened. Was that tough? And if she needs to listen to the baby's cries, she would hear them. Um, Ray Castellino does fabulous work in listening to babies and hearing what they are actually saying, watching their bodies and helping them heal from any traumatic events. This is Marianne Williamson. She just made a bid to become the Democratic candidate for uh, president. And of course she didn't make it, but she's a very influential woman and a very spiritual one. And this is called the gift of change. Seeing this ability to change, seeing this time for change, seeing this time out as a time in to look within and to be able to explore what's going on for us. She calls this spiritual guidance for living your best life. Well, why all the emphasis on changing? Because babies and children, as, as we were babies and children, we developed our beliefs. This would be to respond and fight, flight, or freeze to survive. Our internal dialogue perpetuates our belief that if we keep doing what we have always done, we will live. Now, uh, Porges' new work, which has been actually around since the 90s, um, is saying that we have a social nervous system, that the vagus nerve essentially is primed to respond to another, to have our needs met. But often that didn't happen to us. We were sequestered in nurseries, taken away from our mothers. We were only fed on rigid schedules to meet the convenience of the grown-ups, not when we actually needed to be fed. And what happened is we bypassed that social nervous system and we go when we are triggered into fight or flight or freeze using the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems instead of our social nervous system. And then our internal dialogue perpetuates what we've always done because that's the way that we survived. But Einstein has said um, to do the same thing over and over again uh, and expecting a different result is insanity. And most of us are kind of nuts. It's like, how do we change what we've been doing when we realize that there's something going on with our relationships that we would like to improve or our careers or our prosperity. All of these things could improve because we may be being inhibited by our own history. And this is what Ray Castellino said, quoting Paul, uh, Peter Levine rather, um, in July this year. History is history and it likes to be remembered. This is what I would say. History is history. And it not only likes to be remembered, it is absolutely determined that we are going to work out of those same old programs because they helped us live. And right now, what we can do is recognize we have survived and we can change those programs and we will still live. So here is something out of the UK again, language matters and the communication is at the center of everything. And I'm gonna go through just a few of these, not all of them, but one of them I wanna show you is that the communication impacts your patients, your clients, your students, self-esteem, how you make them feel. Let go of that idea. We don't make anybody feel anything. It's how they feel in response to what we say. So when we are working with someone, we are building trust. We're building a rapport with them so that they can feel confident about what we are saying and the, the counsel that we are giving them. What we say and how we say it is important. The impact is on their self-esteem and we would trust that that's empowering. But some language is not empowering, it's disempowering. This is my favorite book on this subject. It's called Childbirth and Authoritative Knowledge by Robbie Davis Floyd, a um, medical anthropologist. Uh, last I heard she was working at the University of uh, Texas in Austin. And she co-edited this book with Carolyn Sargent. And in the preface, the foreword to this book, it defines authoritative knowledge in a way that I absolutely love. The language of authority figures, that is authoritative knowledge is a way of organizing power relations in a room that makes them seem literally unthinkable in any other way. Wow. That means that if you go into a hospital environment and they're absolutely determined that um, they have the right way for you to do things, but you say, gee, I'd really like to have a midwife. I'd like to have a doula with me. I'm planning on having a natural birth. They could completely disagree with you. When I was doing my dissertation research, I had young women in my study who would say, I tried to tell my parents that I wanna have a natural or a home birth. 
And the authoritative figure, the father, for example, would say, you can't do that. You'll put your baby in danger. It's not a good idea to do that. Maybe without any evidence, but their authoritative knowledge can prevail. So what I'm saying is the words we use express our unconscious beliefs. We can perpetuate society's paradigms by using its language, or we can choose our words to create the change we want to see. And back um, maybe five or six decades ago, this doctor named Moravian formulated this um, concept of what the elements of communication are. 55% is body language. For those of you in somatics, this is good news. 38% is in your tone of voice. Only 7% is in the words. And we know babies are listening into the, in the womb, sensing mother's attitudes through her body language, through her hormones, and hearing her words. So I want to make this point. Changing our words shifts our thinking, our consciousness, to be more consistent with what we advocate. Adopting the language or the words of the dominant paradigm perpetuates that model. We can't foster change if we continue to use words and phrases like, and I'm going to focus on four of those phrases right now, mother-to-be, delivery, nine months, and failure to progress. And these are used all the time, all the time. So I've chosen this hieroglyph here on, the, on the, uh, this picture of a pharaonic woman. That is, she's either a pharaoh or she's the wife of a pharaoh. This is a 5,000-year-old image that still exists on the temple walls of Egypt. She is sitting in a birthing chair. She is not lying on her back. And she's accompanied by beautiful divine beings. These are not cow-headed goddesses. How do you get concepts to survive 5,000 years and still convey their message? If you can't, etched in stone this way, um, it would be the idea that these women are ministering to her with the qualities that are uh, of a mammal, a cow, that eats, is not a predator, eats grass, ruminates, we might say, thinks about things, um, nurses its young from the very beginning. These could be the doulas and the midwives from centuries ago. And I think it's a beautiful, beautiful representation. So if we want to change the paradigm in childbirth from what it is today, you can start by changing your words one word at a time. And I want to say to you, this costs you nothing. Absolutely. You don't have to go out and buy another book. You do not have to take another class. You don't have to do anything but become aware and conscious of the words that you're using. And you could follow these guidelines if you would like. So here we have a silhouette of a woman who has a very big heart. She's awake, aware, open, mindful, trusting, accepting, very loving. <clears throat> and what I would ask you as in your efforts to be this kind of person, which you probably are, well are, are already, is when you talk to your clients, what do you say? Do you call a pregnant woman a mother-to-be? Do you ask who will deliver her baby or where her baby will be delivered? Do you ask when her baby is due based on a nine-month timetable? If you're assisting a woman entering a hospital, do you subscribe to labels like failure to progress? So these are just questions to ask yourself and to examine your own terminology, what words you say. Okay, here we have a woman and she's being supported by her partner and she's pregnant. This is beautiful. And many people would say, oh, you're a mother-to-be. I contend, no, she's not a mother-to-be. She's already a mother. Where does that mother-to-be come from? It comes out of an old fear-based attitude. That is, if we lose the baby, we don't want to be too attached to it because if there is a, um, a miscarriage, for example, then um, we, we want to be able to get over that. Actually, that is very um, backwards thinking. And here is the point. We cannot foster the notion that babies are conscious in the womb and that it is possible to bond with them while they're in utero, utero if we deny that a pregnant woman is a mother. So begin to think about that and begin to see that all mommies, even at this stage, are already mothers. Let's go to the next one. When we are educating about birth, if only 7% of our communication is contained in our words, we have to make sure those words convey our message. Delivery implies someone else is bringing something to us. In my book, in uh, The Renaissance of Birth, I said babies are not pizza. The first definition in the, in the dictionary is, uh, from dictionary.com, is the action of delivering letters, packages, or goods. The second definition is the process of giving birth 
Well, birth and birthing are perfectly good verbs. Or giving birth, which is lovely and much more like what I think uh, we ought to be thinking about when we're talking about birth, but not delivery. In addition, implied by the word delivery is the suggestion that deliveries can be easily scheduled. This is not a healthy attitude. It means that right now we can, we're having cesarean sections at a rate uh, across the country of about a third. But in teaching hospitals, it can be over 50%. We export our technology. It goes to places like Venezuela, Brazil, where they have very good plastic surgeons to deal with scars. But when I talked to an OB-GYN who is uh, actually providing services in Venezuela, I said, what's going on there? What's your C-section rate? She said, oh, it's almost 100% now. Women don't want to feel like, they don't want to give birth like cows. They want modern technology. And so their belief has now become that the way to have a baby is to have their tummies cut open. And this is absolutely bizarre to me, but that's what's going on in the world. So I'm suggesting that we, do, we drop delivery language and move into birth or birthing. But here's another idea. This is from a movie. This is Diane Lane over here on the side. You're probably not going to be able to hear her well. This is her friend, Sandra O, oh, the actress. Sandra has just had a baby. Diane reaches over and picks up the baby and says, what's the baby's name? And Sandra says, Alexandra. And she carries the baby to the window, the shuttered windows in a house in Tuscany. I lived in Italy for three years and I can tell you their windows are magnificent. And she opens the windows and she says, and you can hear her thoughts, Diane Lane says, in Italian, the word for giving birth is dare alla luce, dare alla luce, meaning give to the light. And in Spanish, it's dar a luz. I don't, how did we get to delivery? from these beautiful concepts that other cultures uh, treat in such a very different way. This is from the movie Under the Tuscan Sun, Dare alla luce, to give to the light. What a beautiful, beautiful expression. In fact, uh, it has inspired me for my fourth book, which is much more about birth, um, my fourth fairy tale, uh, to call it Welcome to the Light. So let's move on to what March of Dimes has to say about the time frame of pregnancy. In this small picture over here on the left is a, a representation of a baby's brain at 35 weeks and then at 40 weeks. It goes through a lot more development in those last few weeks. And this is what it says on the right because it's too hard to, for you to see. In the last six weeks, the size of a baby's brain doubles. Babies born early have more learning and behavior problems than babies born at 40 weeks. Babies born early are more likely to have feeding and or breathing problems and more are likely to die of SIDS. So I want to make another point here, and that is, are babies being influenced by what they hear, the words they hear in the womb? And we could base on what we've already learned here, that yes, they are. So here is the point. Words and thoughts associated with them, the hormones circulated when, when words are spoken, and even the intention, for example, to want a pregnancy to reach full term or not, could influence a conscious baby in the womb. Repeating that a pregnancy should come to term in nine months, very masculine way of thinking about um, uh, time, by the way. Um, we think, of, oh, every month has four weeks in it. Sure, nine times four, 36 weeks. That could be causing prenates to exit the womb too soon. So what is prematurity? It is 37, 36 weeks, or even earlier. Prematurity is occurring at a rate of 10% in the major, and is a major cause of infant deaths in our society here in the United States. Let's eliminate nine months as our go-to phrase and promote 10 months, 40 weeks, or 280 days as the ideal length of pregnancy. And why would we do that besides the March of Dimes telling us that it's a good idea? Here's a little graph and it shows a young girl going into puberty at about 14. She's starting her menses, her menstrual cycle. And until she uh, reaches her mid fifties and goes through menopause, she is in um, cycles with the moon. Every 28 days, her body prepares for the conception of a child. And she, if she's not um, impregnated at that time, then what will happen is that tissue will slough. But we've been using birth control for a long time. I have a step-granddaughter that I adore. And right now, she's having great difficulty conceiving a child. She's even used some in vitro fertilization sort of techniques, some technology to help her. And the problem is that she was on birth control pills for years. I was, 
as my, uh, myself, and I would never recommend them because of the difficulties they've created in my own life. Um, this, and I'm 20 years past menopause. So Scientific American has reported that we have now, this is in quotes, um, with women using birth controls for long-term suppression, that is eliminating their periods or eliminating the release of an egg from an ovary, is the largest uncontrolled medical experiment on women in history. So our women need to be informed about what type of birth control they're choosing, what different ones mean, um, how they're, what effects they'll have on their bodies, and we need to know this for ourselves as well. But the bottom line here is that lunar time respects the inherent wisdom of women, and we are all in cycle, ladies, um, with the moon. In fact, we know that if women go into, young women go into dormitory situations, for example, they all start menstruating at the same time. They all come into alignment with one another. It's quite extraordinary. So here we have a picture, we're moving on to another phrase, of a young woman, we'll say she's entering a hospital, the doctor there is having her fill out some paperwork, but she gets scared. She may be five centimeters dilated, but by the time she gets to a room and they do a pelvic examination, the, either she is not dilating um, or she may have regressed and the dilation is actually smaller than she, when she entered the hospital. And what they call that, they, they put women on the clock and they start threatening them and they start saying, well, if you don't have your baby in a certain amount of time, what's going to happen is you're, we're going to give you Pitocin to induce the contractions. And when those are too hard to withstand, we're going to give you an epidural. And if none of that works, we're going to perform a C-section. They call women failures. They call it failure to progress. Well, women are mammals. And if you think about a deer, that is getting ready to have a baby. And uh, it's chased by a predator. Let's say a wolf chases it. it. Everything will seize up. Birth will not occur. She's not gonna drop that baby and have the predator eat it. She's going to run away. And when she is safe, she's going to go into a thicket where can, she can safely give birth. We are, are doing the same thing. So what I am suggesting is that we change failure to progress for all these sweet women who probably have white coat syndrome and are scared to slowing down to relax and feel safer. So just thinking about that phrase, and if you are not with a woman in going into the hospital, let's say that as a doula, you cannot accompany her right now, it might be educate her to know that that might be what's gonna happen. Those might be words that she hears and to school her so that she feels safe, confident, self-assured, all of those things that we talked about earlier so that she is able to um, relax and be able to give birth in, in the time that she and baby are determining is correct for them. So what are you saying to yourself? All this jumble of stuff that's going on in your mind, what words are you using? Men and women speak about 16,000 words a day, but we use many of the same words over and over again, just like those phrases. I will tell you, I have given talks like this to people who really know better. And the next thing I know is in the next sentence we have, having a conversation, they're talking about delivery. They're talking about mothers-to-be. And so it's really challenging to become conscious enough to change the words that we are saying. So the, the way that you were schooled essentially helps create this idea of normal and what you think of as rational. But what you tell yourself could be rational lies. That's a pun. It's not rational I-Z-E, it's rational lies. They're simply not the truth. It's stuff that you become to believe about yourself based on the way that you were treated. What matters most is how you see yourself. So here's this little kitten over on the left, looking in the mirror, seeing this giant lion, and you really get the impression that, oh yes, this kitten really has a sense that he's gonna grow into some powerful being. Well, what do we know about people who look in the mirror? Let's say an anorexic woman, but she sees this fat. And so she could be literally devouring her own muscle tissue and be skinny as a rail, but think that she is fat because what she sees, what her, her internal dialogue is, what her beliefs are. On the right, we see this young woman who is totally burdened with, I can't do it, I'm not worthy, I must be perfect, I can't make a mistake, I'm not good enough, nobody loves me. Those kinds of uh, beliefs are instilled in us and they're at, held at an implicit or a subconscious level. The difference between developing and growing up in love, that is acceptance, or fear, disapproval, is the message we internalize 
those beliefs we have about ourselves. Based on how we're treated, we develop beliefs about ourselves and we call that self-esteem or the lack of self-esteem. I'm my, In my counseling practice, I mostly have clients who are between 50 and 70, and many of them are carrying these same messages around. They've been carrying them for decades of, I'm not good enough, there's something wrong with me. So what are some words and phrases you could change in your own self-talk? So let's take this as an example. Here's a young woman, and next to her is a childbirth educator, or a doctor, or teacher, or um, um, whatever position you hold, a midwife, a doula. And let's say that you're imagining yourself talking to her, you uh, come up to her and you're a little out of breath because you're late and she's receptive to learning about pre and perinatal psychology or the ideas that you wanna share, but here's your dialogue, here's what you say. I'm sorry I'm late, I'm hoping your delivery goes well, nine months will pass quickly. Of course, I'll try to give you as much help as I can. Now that's a very common sort of way to encounter this young woman and talk to her. I'm gonna give you a different way of thinking about that in just a moment. So would you put your money in the bank and hope company or would you put it in the bank and trust company? Hope essentially implies doubt. Um, if I go to you in the hospital and I just talk to your doctor in the hallway and I go in and I say, gee, I hope you're getting better. That person might say, wait a minute, you just talked to my daughter. What do you mean you hope I'm getting better? Of course I'm getting better. It might be better to say, I trust you're getting better. It sounds a lot more confident when you do that. Here's another one. Yoda would say, no, try not, do or do not. There is no try. Try implies failure. Finish this sentence. I tried, but I failed. It's absolutely implied in the word try. And action is what you really wanna do. So when I was going to school, uh, I've done this a lot in my 40s, 50s, and 60s. I hear people in the hallways just before they go into a test, gee, I hope I pass this test. Is there not doubt that they're going to pass the test? Or let's say you invite someone to a party and they say, um, gee, I hope I can make it. I'll try to be on time. Those are not words that indicate that they have any commitment to being there at all. I wouldn't count on them. I wouldn't set a place for dinner for somebody who doesn't say that they're committed to be there. They might say something different like, Oh, yes, um, I will be there on time, you know, to express the action that they anticipate taking. This is the one that drives me the craziest. It's so sorry. Um, many of the women that I talk to use this as an affirmation all the time. Sorry means culpable and guilty. Please substitute, excuse me, I apologize, I regret their action words. If someone tells you that they've experienced a loss, I feel so sad. My heart hurts when I hear you say this. You can empathize with them without making an affirmation of being sorry. It's a terrible sabotage mechanism. Actually, it's a very um, effective sabotage mechanism to keep you from being all that you can be. So those are words to change. Let's go back to our situation and let's have a new conversation. So you're hurrying, this woman is receptive, and you say, I apologize, I'm running a little late. Thank you for being patient. I trust your pregnancy and birth are wonderful experiences for you. 10 months will pass so quickly, each day can be another opportunity to bond with your baby. Of course, I'll give you as much information and support as I can. Now you're saying essentially the same thing that was said in the previous example, but it's in a different way, a much more conscious way, using the words and phrases that I had suggested to you um, in, in the previous slides. Now this comes out of the um, British Medical Journal and there are just some effects because we are living in a time where the news is talking about Black Lives Matter. It's talking about anybody who looks any different from us matters. We are all one. We all have the same concerns. In the United States, our infant mortality rate and our maternal mortality rate are much, much higher for women who are not Caucasian. It's really unfortunate. So basically this says that the key of effect to effectively communicate options and recommendations and respectfully accept a woman's fully informed decision is, this is essential. This is a key to our communicating with them. And language matters as a way of respecting women's views and ensuring that they're empowered to make decisions. And from this same source, this says, the use of insensitive language can be indicative of an underlying malaise. 
which reveals underlying attitudes or prejudices. It's essential that we achieve respectful practice, ensuring that women have complete understanding and control of their own care. And I love these examples because we have uh, women of different cultures, some in roles of uh, more authority, some in women who are pregnant, and, you know, some, and some vice versa. And they're all beautiful and wonderful and knowledgeable. And I think they represent what this idea is about. This is from two, 2018 publication. So here we have a woman who is present. She is very in touch with her body sensations. She is noticing, she is appreciating, she's tracking, she's observing, allowing, attending, breathing, listening to her body and what's going on in the moment. I would also say that this is being conscious. Being present is being conscious. And so what I would say in, with this particular picture is that we are broadcasting all the time. We don't have to be carrying a megaphone around. Our thoughts and our feelings are being presented to others all the time. It's difficult to tell a person a lie without their, their knowing it. Gee, I wish I were gonna to come to that party of yours, but you can tell they really don't wanna come. So they use words like hope and I'll try to be there. And you know that what they're broadcasting to you is that they don't really wanna come at all. So we're broadcasting our thoughts, our feelings all the time. And so what I want to do is go back to chaos theory. There's actually a movie called Chaos Theory. Ryan Reynolds plays a psychologist who's talking to a prospective son-in-law. And he says to this kid, he describes to this kid, the rigors of the relationship um, that essentially produced his daughter that this young man wants to marry. And what we see is that in this butterfly effect, you know, we don't have chaos everywhere. The constellations, the stars are not careening into one another. There is an order under all of the chaos. And what we see in that, in the best sense, in this butterfly effect, is that this butterfly, not too long ago, was a caterpillar, created a chrysalis around itself, liquefied itself, literally took its DNA and reconstituted it and came out as this gorgeous butterfly. This butterfly is a symbol of transformation, which is what I am saying to each of you, to be the butterflies that you are, to have your words, your language, be consistent with what the story is that you wanna tell people, what you wanna do in order to help them. And what the last words in the movie Chaos Theory is, is this, love is the least chaotic thing in the universe because, because you can choose to give and receive it. What I find with the clientele that I typically work with is that women know how to give. I'm sure you do. We know how to rescue, we know how to nurse, we know how to mother, we know how to attend and take care of others really well. What we haven't learned because of the ways that we were conceived, gestated, born and treated is how to receive it. Because love was often very, very conditional. It was an unconditional love with the beautiful supporting parenting that we're learning these days, we probably didn't get that. So I would suggest that you open yourself up to being a beautiful butterfly, to receiving love as well as giving it. And I'm closing with this. Consciously change the childbirth language you use and change the world of childbirth. Our words affect ourselves, mommies, babies, and our whole society. We hold the future of childbirth in our hands. I thank you so much for your participation and listening and um, cogitating on what all of this means. Wow, thank you so much, Susan. Thank you, it's, um, it's free to everybody to be able to make changes that are consistent with uh, changing this paradigm in childbirth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a dynamic presentation. I don't know if you have time for questions or if anyone would like to ask any. Sure, I'll hang out. Does anyone have any questions for Susan? Hi, it was, it's Kim. Hi, I want to thank you so much. It feels like I'm, I'm playing in home with everything you've shared. So, uh, mm -hmm. so thank you very much. My, my question that I have is in my particular situation, my mother shared that she consciously at least, but she didn't know that I was there until a doctor told me she was six months pregnant and then went into shock. Um, I can create different languaging in welcoming of me and I have ideas, but I wanted to invite 
if there's anything in particular from all of your experience, from myself and, and other people that I've met who then go through, it's not so much anymore, but not feeling seen or heard or if, mm -hmm. what dialogues might you invite? Oh, that's, that's lovely. And I can already sense your healing. Just asking the question invites more healing in. Um, bless your mother. Um, we really want to be appreciative of her and um, the fact that she wasn't so aware of her body. But I, here's something that I have done with my own daughter. And I believe that we can do this in reverse. I think we can do this to birth ourselves and to uh, comfort our mothers as well. Um, there's a guy named Tony Madrid, a uh, psychologist out in California, who talks about bonding and has taught women to go into a light alpha state. It's a light hypnotic state. And you can just do it by closing your eyes. It already begins to uh, lower the frequencies, the brain waves in your, in your brain. And what we can do is um, give birth again or be born again um, in ways that are delightful to us. And I would suggest no hospital. I would suggest in the clouds with angels or in a beautiful forest under a tree on a mat of uh, beautiful moss. Find a way. It could be under the sea. My, when I work with my husband sometimes, he loves the oceans, a Cancerian water sign anyway. And um, everything he does is under the water. And of course, in his own imagination, he breathes under the water. So you can bring your awareness. We have no idea, most people do not, of the power of our imaginations to create something wonderful. You know that the brain doesn't know the difference between what's real and what's imagined. You know, you, could, you can startle awake in the night because you dreamt that you fell out of bed, but you didn't fall at all. You're still in bed. Basically, the subconscious mind is processing all the time. When you give it that opportunity, that's one of my favorite techniques is EMDR, is when we move our eyes, um, we, we recreate REM. When we close our eyes, we go into a slightly altered brainwave state. We can begin to use our imaginations in the most beautiful, creative ways. It was, I think I quoted um, Lynn McTaggart, who talked about the power of our consciousness. So my sense is, you know, I'm already seeing you born in absolute perfection. You know, it may have been best that you didn't, weren't seen for six months because mother would have been filling you with, with thoughts of fear or whatever her negativity was. So maybe you were waiting until that particular time to be discovered. And now I, I've, I've said that I've, I've been flying under the radar, you know, I've joked about <laughs> goochie, 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 hello, you know, um, but yeah, so uh, give some time to other people. Thank you very much, Susan. And I love your Tonka. That's absolutely beautiful. I have two in front of me and another yeah, one. I, I noticed the one behind you. Yeah, <laughs> that's another story. Okay, indeed, thank you. Indeed, I'm so pleased. Uh, you, you I have a question if there's time. Sure, uh, there's time. Yes. I'm concerned. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. So uh, with your background being both in the world of theology and science, I, I just have to ask you what your understanding is of the fusion between the divine and human and are our words the words of God and are God's words our words? How do you express that and put that together? Oh, okay. Um, yes, I've spent uh, many decades exploring this. And um, what I uh, believe myself is that uh, we are made in the image of God. And in that respect, we are, we are children of God in however you, however you think of the creative source. So um, what we do right now in hospitals is we take babies away from their mothers. It's a reiteration of the separation that we felt when we came from spirit into a body, when we incarnated. And so my sense is that um, we're attempting to find that again, to find that union. Not only are we all one, that you know, each of you and, um, and I have uh, things in common. We, um, we are precious to one another and we are all part of God and the consciousness that makes up the entire universe. And you can say it in a couple of different ways. Um, I, I wanted to, I found a, a quote, a cool co quote from Nikola Tesla today when I was searching around. And um, it's, it, he says, if you wish to understand the universe, think of energy, frequency, and vibration. And if we think of ourselves in these more quantum physical terms as energy, it's all the same stuff. We're all the same stuff. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. 
Okay, thank you. Anyone else have a question for Susan? Hi, I'm from California. My, my name is Amy, and I'm just wondering if we want to expand the knowledge about this frequency energy and all that, because I totally, you know, buy that and I've heard that or imagined that before. And to expand that, where what can I do to expand that knowledge or that area to so that I can be aware of my energy and all that, you know, whatever. Yeah. Well, thank you, Amy. I really appreciate your question. Um, energy psychology is relatively new. There's a whole organization that promotes it. There are many different modalities within that. You can read about it on the internet. You can um, look into tapping. You can look into uh, the modality that is my favorite, which is EMDR. Bruce Lipton promotes Psych K and others from his website. Many of these things you can do from your own home. You can begin to explore and it's amazing. One website will lead you to another website and your intention is so very important. As you begin to think about, think these thoughts about energy, vibration, consciousness, you will find resources flowing to you. You will find things that just sort of pop into your lap. There are signs and wonders everywhere and you will find exactly the right resources. In fact, you know, you can call me, you can call Kate. Um, you're welcome to talk to me about um, various uh, things that I have found that seem to work. I'm not interested in proselytizing. I'm not interested in selling any particular brand. But if you have questions, I'd be happy to tell, share my path with you. Thank you. I will call. <laughs> Thank you all so much. This has been absolutely a delight. I, I cannot tell you. I have, I'm becoming more and more passionate about this subject. <laughs> and it shows. <laughs> well, thank you, Susan, again for tonight. And um, I really so loved it. And thanks for coming and sharing your passion with us. And thank you, everyone, for coming. I'll thank be you. distributing this in, um, into a YouTube. And so uh, everyone will get a copy. Uh, there are some slides at the very end that I did not show you that are sort of a little gift and it's um, there's a, sort of a, a pun and double meaning in it because I love metaphor so you may find a surprise at the end okay. all right okay thank you it was Goodbye. amazing it was thank amazing you. thank you thank, thank you. you I could just listen you. to your thoughts <laughs> <laughs> that's really lovely to hear thank okay. you all right thank you okay. bye, -bye. bye now Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you.